Uh, good morning. We are now live streaming. Welcome to Helsinki and StanCon. Uh, I want to thank um, all our sponsors. So we were able to give some student scholarships, uh, free registration, and some uh, some students got also um, some travel funding. Also help all, all the with the keeping the costs low and having still the uh, video streaming and so on. Uh, of this was um, easier than I thought to organize this. And thanks for the previous Tancon organizers, Daniel Lee, Breck Baldwin, Mike Bedancourt, uh, Jonah Gabri did great job with the submissions, Lauren Kennedy with the uh, finalizing the program, helping here all the time. Uh, all my postdoc and students have made great job um, uh, helping here um, and feeling good with the, the how this is going. Um, <clears throat> there's a few things I had to remember to mention here. So uh, Bob Carpenter and Jonah Gabri. They are giving these roadmap talks, and often people have questions, but if uh, the speaker in the end of the presentation asks questions, it's quite often that people need a few minutes to think. Now you have several hours, and for Jonah talk, more than one day to think about the questions. Uh, if you want to know where Stan, where Jonah, uh, is talking about interfaces, where they are going. Tonight, uh, today, at the end of the day, uh, we have um, Birds of Feather program, BREC. Yeah? Okay. Uh, this one. Hello. All right. So this is called Birds of a Feather. And it's short for Birds of a Feather Flock Together. It's if you have something that you're interested in talking about with some person other than you, as, mu as many people are as interested, you can have a little organization. So, for example, if I wanted to do one, I might do one on clustering. You'll hand me before 5, 17, 10 today a, the title of your talk. You don't have to do it in this form. And then one sentence describing it. I'm going to stand up here at 5.15 and read them all off, you're going to come down, I'll hand you a sheet of paper with the name of your birds of a feather group, all right? And you'll come up front here and you'll collect your people, all right? All you need is one other person in order to have a successful birds of a feather session. So these are little subtopics about things that you care about. So let's revisit this. I'm Breck, you're going to find me up until 510 during the day and hand me your birds of a feather description. There's no peer review on this, just whatever you want to do. You're going to tell me what the title is, you're going to write it down, you give me a one sentence description, and again, Breck, me, find me. If you can't find me and you're confused and whatever, find Aki. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, so this was used in Asilomar and it was great. People were really happy to find other people interested in the same topics, and it was also great for Stan developers because now people were first discussing in a small group what they want to know, and then they came to ask together. So, needed to answer only once. Good, very good questions. Um, posters. So, their uh, po poster wall company is just installing the poster walls. So, during the next break, go hang up your poster, there should be pins. Um, and if someone hasn't got the certificate for the yesterday tutorials, Lauren is over there currently, and she has more after I've signed them. Okay, um, and then uh, we have two sponsors uh, who are also saying a few words. And let's start with Elisa. Um. Mister.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Nidhi Singh. I'm the director of research at ELISA. And today, I'll talk very briefly about what we do at ELISA. OK. I'll talk a little bit about what we do at ELISA, and specifically ELISA research, why we are interested in doing probabilistic programming at ELISA, and what kind of research collaborations we are open for at this point in time. So for those of you who do not know what ELISA is, so ELISA is a telecom company uh, in Finland and Estonia. It was founded way back in 1882, so it's pretty old. Uh, and it operates uh, mostly in telecom uh, sector and uh, ICT and online services in general. It has a lot of online services like ELISA Entertainment, ELISA Kiria, and so on. Uh, Revenue-wise, we're pretty strong. Uh, it has 1.8 billion euros in revenue for every year. And it has around 4,700 employees. Uh, and we operate mostly in Finland and Estonia. Uh, with respect to research that we do, so we mostly do our research in, in machine learning. Uh, and that's why we're interested in doing probabilistic programming that as applied to machine learning. All right, so I cannot talk about all the research problems that we have right now, but I can list out few domains that we have uh, in our research uh, area. So one of them is uh, smart factory management. There, what we try to do is we try to optimize certain processes using machine learning. And the expected outcome typically is a set of actions that a human operator can take. All right. Uh, that's a very generic description of smart factory management, but there's a lot going on, but I cannot go in details. Another application area for machine learning that we have is cybersecurity. It's a big area for us because we receive a lot of threats of different kinds every day. Uh, and one simple example is, uh, let's say we want to identify bullying activities uh, in, in chat rooms. So we have millions of chats, millions of text messages that we have every day, and we want to identify if there's any bullying going on in these chats. Uh, another domain that we have is generic, uh, let's say, network management system where we, if we can build a machine learning model that can identify which part of network may go down in the near future, that can enable us to do very comprehensive preventive maintenance. Uh, but it's given our data sets and given the generic nature of the problem, it's not an easy problem to solve. So it's a work in progress. Another problem domain that I have is around uh, customer interaction. Now, customer interaction, uh, it may sound very general again. But think of it as uh, developing uh, voice recognition models or NLP models that we have. We can reduce those models in different ways uh, to reduce the workload on our customer care. So customer care in any company is very expensive. So if we can use machine learning models to reduce the load on that customer care department, that's, it's, it's going to have a huge impact on the business. There are many more problem domains I can talk about, but I don't have really the time. But these are the main ones. And the way we do research in ELISA is uh, some things are done in-house, but many of them uh, require some collaborations. So uh, currently, we are collaborating with 1,000 researchers across the globe. Uh, we also collaborate with more than 80 startups at this point in time. So with startups, what we do is uh, we discuss some things with them. And if we find that the solutions they're developing is interesting for us, then we can either uh, give them the te technical guidance or we can be the early customers for them. And, and there can be different ways in which we can support them, and we do. Last thing I would like to mention here is uh, we are very actively involved in Finnish Center of AI. Uh, I think many of you might know that. Um, we have many projects ongoing with the Alto University with different research groups. In case you have uh, some questions or you want to contact or you want to discuss some ideas about some potential collaborations, feel free to reach me. I'm here all day. And if you want to discuss it later on, uh, you can also reach me at my, at my email address. Thank you. Uh, uh, presentation is by Bayer. Just keep it close to your mouth. Yep. Hi, everyone. So, thank you for um, giving us the chance to actually um, present um, why we sponsored and who we are. Um, I think quite some people know us. Um, we are from Bayer, so I'm Aaron, I'm a senior data scientist at Bayer. I'm here with two other colleagues, um, Jacob and Andre. Um, could you just say hello? Yeah. 
Um, so um, just to tell you briefly um, what Bayer is, maybe um, we are a life science collaboration, a life science company. Um, so that means on the one hand we work on pharmaceuticals and we have, uh, our goal is really to achieve science for a better life. And we do that with two main motivations. The first motivation is that we try to find uh, cures and drugs for um, future diseases for our problems in, um, to s actually improve people's quality of life. And on the other hand, we also work on kind of finding um, new materials, raw materials, and use our expertise in biomedical processes to actually tackle challenges of the future, which we will encounter due to increasing populations and diseases. And um, so it's a life science co uh, company. We have uh, pharmaceuticals where we actually work on probabilistic programming. Um, so that is prescription drugs, but also on the other hand, we have um, over-the-counter consumer health um, products like aspirin, for instance, you, you might know, but also crop science, which is um, yeah, where we work on crop detection and seeds and where also our animal health um, division belongs to. And BASE is quite central in, in, uh, in Bayer in our work. Um, so here I just briefly put together like one thing which is very important for us and why we also wanted to support the STAN community is it's the community aspect, which makes it really uh, uh, ex um, special for us. So we have internal communities, like we have a base community. Um, we also support the recently founded uh, Stan user group in Berlin, which is actually honored to um, host Bob and Mitzi, I think, next week, Monday. So if you're in Berlin and you want to see them, just join us. You find us on Meetup. And we have also a journal club where we look into recent activities and papers and kind of exchange and thrive and foster a, a exchange and collaboration. Um, some of the tools we work currently and we would like to work in the future are yeah, like survival models. And I'm thinking we should have one of the um, birds of like the sessions of discussion about survival models, joint longitudinal and time to event, Bayesian neural networks, which we would like to go more deeper in the future and latent directly allocation. Um, and we are currently looking for uh, data scientists, so if you're keen to, to work for, for a life science company, uh, chat with us. I mean, the three of us are here. We are really happy to, to discuss and to tell you a bit about what we do. Um, you see some of the um, yeah, areas where we're looking for recruits. And uh, yeah, again, so if you want to chat uh, via email, you can also reach out to me or um, our head of data science, David Wow. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, and uh it seems that uh, even if we started delayed, we were did great job with the hurrying up. So we are on time for our first invited speaker, Maggie Liu, uh, who is from European Space Agency. And overall, also, so in January, Asilomar was my first TANCON. I was really impressed on the variety of applications people are using, STAN, uh, how challenging applications. And here also, during these two days, we are so varying topics, and this is also the, the kind of really big because of estimating the mass of galaxy clusters. So you can't get bigger data than that. Please, Maggie. Thanks, Maggie. Okay, sorry for taking so long to sort that out. Um, before I start, I want to thank all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about hierarchical modeling of galaxy clusters for cosmology. So what I mean by cosmology is trying to understand like, how the universe works. And there are a set number of parameters that describe like, how the universe was in the past and how it will evolve in the future. Um, some of the work I'm going to be showing here is uh, work in collaboration with these people here. Right. OK. So for those of you who are not physicists or ash astronomers or whatever, um, the universe um, started off very hot and very dense. And you can think of it 
as a photon baryon plasma. So the light, the photons, were coupled together with the baryons, which is like the matter. And then the, the, with these quantum fluctuations, density fluctuations. And because the universe was so hot and so dense, it began to expand over time. And in these images here, you can see at different time steps the evolution of the universe. Um, so there was expansion, um, there was gravity, and dense regions became more dense, and less, region, uh, less dense regions became less dense. And so the initial fluctuations in the early universe, they grew into this structure that we see today. Um, this is what we call the large-scale structure, or um, also the co cosmic web. And it's kind of like this spongy texture where in the most dense regions, the densest areas um, live galaxy clusters. And galaxy clusters are the main interest of my scientific research. Um, they are the largest gravitationally bound objects in our universe. And they're comprised of tens, if not thousands, of galaxies all orbiting around each other. And they're interesting for me because they're rich in dark matter, X-ray emitting gas, and stars and galaxies. So they're ideal laboratories to study astrophysics. From simulations, we know that the universe looks very different depending on the cosmology that defines it. So here you have two different simulations with two different cosmological inputs, and you see that structure clusters very differently depending on this cosmology. This means that galaxy clusters are very sensitive probe to do cosmology. And one tool that we can use to, use, uh, to do cosmology with galaxy clusters is um, the halo mass function. So this is basically um, the number of galaxy clusters on the y-axis as a function of mass um, within a volume and uh, distance or redshift that we call it. Um, for various input cosmologies, here I'm only looking at the amount of mass matter there is in our universe. And S SA or sigma 8 is um, the size of the fluctuations in our early universe. Um, depending on these parameters, the halo mass function looks very different. So it seems very simple to do cosmology with galaxy clusters. All you have to do is measure the masses of loads of galaxy clusters, um, bin them up, and figure out how many galaxy clusters of each mass bin you have. And then you've done cosmology. But it turns out it's not that easy because Mass is not a direct observable. We can't see it directly. But one way that we can infer it is through an effect called gravitational lensing. So this is one of Einstein's theories. And um, the idea is that if you've got a very far away galaxy and it emits some light, as that light travels towards Earth, it becomes perturbed by any um, intervening gravitational field. Um, in this case, you've got this massive galaxy cluster in the center, and the light is practically bent by it as it travels to the Earth. So if you imagine, for example, this laser, the light would travel in a straight line. But if gravity of Earth is so strong, it would be able to bend this light, and the light would actually fall to the ground. What this means in weak gravitational lensing, which is what I use, is that if you've got a load of far, far away galaxies, and they're perfectly circular on the sky. And you were to put a massive galaxy cluster right in the center of it, you'll see that the galaxies, their shapes, are distorted towards the galaxy cluster. And the more mass a galaxy cluster has, the more distortion you'll see on these faraway galaxies behind the galaxy cluster. And this is an effect that we call gravitational shear. And in an ideal world, it would be very easy to measure because you would just measure the shapes of the galaxies on the sky, and you could just figure out how much 
mass there is in this galaxy cluster, which is mostly dark matter, which we can't see. Um, but in the real world, things aren't that easy because galaxies are not perfectly circular. Um, they have all shapes and all sizes, and they're ori orientated very randomly um, on the sky. Um, so what we have to do is we can break down the ellipticity into two components, a tangential component and a cross component. And these are just determined by the semi-major and ma uh, minor axes of a galaxy and its position with uh, respect to the galaxy cluster center. And if you average over many, many galaxy ellipticities, you will see that the average tangential ellipticity is e equal to the average gravitational shear. If there's no gravitational lensing occurring, then you would expect this signal to be zero on average. And um, the cross shear is always zero unless you've got something wrong, so it's a systematic check. But galaxy clusters are not solid bodies of mass. They have a density distribution. And so their density falls off as radius to the minus one at, clo at close to the cluster center and radius to the minus two on the outskirts. And so from simulations, we've developed um, some density profile that quite uh, describes very well galaxy cluster masses. Uh, and if you integrate this along the line of sight, because we don't see the 3D structure of a galaxy cluster, what we see is a projected, um, projected image, um, you can determine its shear. And the shear of a galaxy cluster, um, you can convey this as a shear profile, as a function of radius. So this is tangential shear as a function of radius. And it's sensitive mostly to mass. Um, so the mass determines its normalization. And its concentration, how concentrated its mass is, is uh, sensitive to the slope of this shear profile. So now we know the data, we've got some ellipticities, and we know our model, which is an NFW profile, to give us mass and concentrations. How can we measure a mass and a concentration of a galaxy cluster using Bayesian statistics? Well, we can start off with Bayes' theorem. It's very simple. Uh, posterior probability of A given B equals probability of B given A, which is your likelihood, times a prior probability of A over probability of B, which is the marginal likelihood, or your evidence, which is just pretty much a normalizing factor we don't need to worry very much about. But with this equation, we can write pretty much every model that we need to write. So to fit the mass and concentration of a galaxy cluster, the model that we are fitting, what we're interested in is the probability of a mass and concentration of a galaxy cluster, cluster given its um, shear profile. And using Bayes' theorem, you can write it in this way, where you have a prior on your mass and a prior on your concentration. So the problem is, how do we choose the prior on the masses and concentrations? And a very principled approach is to say that we don't see any galaxy clusters larger than 10 to the 16 solar masses. And anything under 10 to the 13 solar masses is more of a galaxy rather than a galaxy cluster. So you can take like a log uniform uh, prior on mass. And concentration, you can use a uniform between 1 and 10, which is typically used. Or actually, concentration is actually quite difficult to constrain because it's, it's only really constrained by the inner regions of the galaxy cluster, where we usually don't have many background galaxies to calculate the shear. Um, so people often fix it to an external scaling relation between concentration and mass, um, and this is typically taken from simulations. In STAN, this is really easy to write. And for many years, I wrote like a Metropolis Hastings and ran it on that, and it was just slow as hell. But with STAN, it was, it was really quick. Um, 
We have a function that describes the NFW profile, and it basically takes in a mass and a concentration and spits out a shear. Uh, for the data, we've got the number of data points, your radii, um, the shear, and the uncertainties on the shear that we observe. And for parameters, I use log mass and concentration. Um, in the model, what I have is we calculate the uh, true shear from the NFW function, given a mass, concentration, and radius. Um, we set the priors down here, and we basically draw the observed shears from um, the true shears given by the NFW profile at that mass and concentration. But it's not ideal because galaxies in real life are elliptical, like I said. The shear that it experiences from gravitational lensing changes its shape of the order 1%. And then if we're observing it from Earth, which is typically the case, um, our galaxies are blurred by the atmosphere and the telescope. Um, we also get pixelization from the detectors, and there's also noise. So measuring a 1% signal on all of this is actually quite hard. And so if you're fitting individual galaxy cluster masses that have a high signal-to-noise ratio, so very massive galaxy clusters, um, Fitting them individually is not that difficult, sure. But most of our galaxy clusters, if you remember the halo mass function, they mostly lie in the low mass range. So they're mostly low signal to noise objects. And so in this case, you're pretty much dominated by the prior if you're fitting on an individual basis. Another option you could use is to stack the signals of many galaxy clusters together. And this is what people do typically in my field. But then the problem is, how do you know what galaxy clusters to stack together? Because you don't know their true mass a priori. Um, and you have to assume that all galaxy clusters have the same mass that you're stacking together, which is not the case. And this might misrepresent some outliers. So to summarize what people typically do in my field um, is that they measure the shapes of galaxies. This might have some calibration and some of their errors in. Um, they typically assume Gaussian errors at each stage, and they propagate them through. We fit shear profiles to that, typically using binning, some inappropriate priors, stacking. And then we figure out that actually we Masses are quite expensive to measure because we need very long observation times. And so we often don't have enough galaxy cluster masses to do cosmology. So what we do is we use um, scaling relations with other observables that are quite cheap to measure, such as luminosities um, and temperatures, for example. And we fit a scaling relation to this so that we can generate lots of masses. We bend this up and then fit a halo mass function to get the cosmology. So each of these steps, you're pretty much propagating error after error to get to your cosmology. And this is not good. Masses are very difficult to measure precisely and accurately, especially with weak lensing. And so these errors are propagated through. And if you, um, and they suffer a lot of selection effects and biases, and this one in particular, the Eddington bias, which means the shape of the halo mass function is really steep. So if you're using binning, then a lot of your objects are in low mass bins, and they're more likely to scatter to a high mass bin than high mass objects are to scatter down to a low mass bin. So overall, your shape of your halo mass function that you get this way is going to be biased as well. Um, so, oh, that's not meant to be like that. Uh, that was meant to say Gaussian. But <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, so, ideally, we know that all galaxy clusters, um, they come from the halo mass function convolved with the selection function. So we, we don't observe all galaxy clusters from the halo mass function. The low mass objects we're likely to miss because of our constraints from observations. And um, so one way to get around this is to approximate the halo mass function and selection function as a Gaussian. And all your galaxy cluster masses and concentrations should come from this population distribution. But this distribution is sensitive to your cosmology um, and the selection functions. So we want to let this be free parameters in our model, and we can fit it with all of our data. And this is basically what hierarchical modeling is. So for a simple hierarchical approach, our priors on mass and concentration, now we s simultaneously um, get all of these from a multivariate Gaussian distribution with some mean and some covariance matrix. And these are parameters that we fit for in our model. And now we're fitting the joint um, probability of all the galaxy clusters at the same time. So we fit for the mean, population mean of the galaxy clusters, masses and concentrations, and their covariance matrix. All the masses and all the concentrations of all the galaxy clusters at the same time, given all of the shear profiles and their uncertainties. The reason why people haven't been doing this before in my field is just because there's so many parameters to fit for at the same time. And so with something like STAN, we can deal with this. And before with other samplers, it was very difficult. Um, so you can rewrite that equation in the following form. So now instead of a prior on mass and concentration, we have this extra likelihood that the masses and concentrations are drawn from the population parameters. Um, we have some extra priors, though, on the population means and covariances um, that we have to set. These are called the hyper priors. And the ones that I use are for the log mass. Um, 32 mean and standard, uh, standard deviation of 1, and 1.5 for the log concentrations, and a width of 0 0.5. Um, like Ben said in his talk, um, we don't need conjugate priors to sample for the covariance matrix, um, but we can optimize using Cholesky um, factorization. Um, so we decompose the covariance matrix into a correlation matrix, and it's kind of scale vector, which is basically like a, um, like a vector of the standard deviations you can think of it as. Um, and the priors on that, we use a normal on the scale uh, between 0 and 2, and then uh, uh, LKJ prior on the um, Cholesky uh, factor. The sc that stand code for that looks like this. Um, so we still, we have all of the galaxy, we have the number of galaxy clusters, we have the number of data points, um, the radii, the shears observed, the uncertainties on the shears, and then the hyper prior parameters. Um, the parameters that we're fitting are the uh, population means and the covariance um, parameters and the log um, log masses and concentrations, basically. And basically, you just, instead of drawing a prior um, for the masses and concentrations individually, they all come from um, this uh, mu. And, well, we use a multi-normal Cholesky to draw. Um, so instead of sigma, we have um, the Cholesky factor L. We tested this on toy simulations. Um, so here are 38 galaxy clusters. The red is the truth. Um, and the black are like the posterior drawers. Um, on average, we recover the shear to within 10% uncertainties, and most of the parameters within 2% uh, uncertainty, which is quite good. In hierarchical modeling, the more data that you have, the better constraints you get on the population. So when we increase this to 200 galaxy clusters, 
everything um, improved in terms of um, the parameters. Um, when you look at um, going back to how people did it originally, um, from those simulations, you can see uh, these are binned individual masses, uh, the true masses binned individually, right? And the red are the binned uh, masses that we fit using our hierarchical model. And you can see that the fitted masses are overestimated in the center and kind of underestimated in the tails. And this is simply because using point estimates is never a good idea because it just doesn't take into account the uncertainties on the individual masses. And so if we do it as a population and take the population mean, we, we get this distribution, which better estimates the true population over, overall um, rather than taking the individual mass measurements because it takes into account the uncertainties on all of the mass estimates. Um, to be more realistic, we tested these on hydrodynamical simulations. Um, so these are dark matter simulations. Um, we generate shear from them by doing ray tracing of the light. Um, we get shear catalogs and we fit the shears, etc. 632 galaxy clusters uh, with realistic noise and um, observations that we see. So here we use five galaxies per arc minute squared, which is typically what we observe. If we had better telescopes and longer observation times, this would improve and it would improve the uncertainties on our data, sure. But this is typically what we're working with and a realistic shape noise. Again, the red is the truth and the black are the fitted. Um, log mass, log concentration. On mass, we recover them really well. So this is the truth on the bottom, and this is the fit, and the equality line is across there. So the masses, we fit quite well. Um, and bear in mind that with simulations, we know the true 3D mass of a, a galaxy cluster, whereas when we observe, we only see a 2D projection of that. So there is scatter. Concentration is a bit more difficult to constrain, but it's still quite reasonable. Um, you might be thinking that we're mostly dominated by the high signal-to-noise objects, so the most high mass objects. And here I show that it isn't true. Um, the black dots show you the hierarchical fit binned up for all of these little points, and the gray show uh, the non-hierarchical fit. And the point is that because of the halo mass function, we have a lot more low mass systems than we have high mass systems. So these are going to weight more um, on your population parameters than your high mass systems, even though they have um, uh, lower uncertainties. Um, Next, applying this to real data, we take the XXL survey, which is two 25 square degree patches on the sky um, using XMM Newton telescope. So these are X ray detected galaxy clusters, and it's a serendipitous survey, so it's not pointed at each galaxy cluster specifically, we just detect them. Um, we take the brightest 100 galaxy clusters. And we see what weak lensing data that we have from the CFHT lens uh, weak lensing survey. And of these galaxy clusters, 38 of them have low redshifts and temperature measurements. And these are important because um, higher than a redshift of 0 0.6, so very far away galaxy clusters, we don't have many background galaxies because typically, like in lensing, you want background galaxies to be twice as far away as the galaxy cluster to get a good signal. Um, and these are the posteriors that we get on the population. So generally, quite well um, constrained. Um, so one um, 
natural thing that comes out of hierarchical modeling is a thing called shrinkage. Um, basically, the galaxy cluster masses that we are measuring are, can be seen as like a quasi-stacking approach because they move towards the population mean. And so on this plot, what I show you is um, the variance in the population mean mass on the x-axis and the mass value on the y-axis. And these individual points are the 38 galaxy clusters that we measured at their mass value and the population, um, population variance on the log mass um, that we fit. When we fit non-hierarchically, like treating each of the galaxy clusters independently, we're basically assuming that there's no population uh, the population variance is infinite because they're all in independent of each other and they don't come from an underlying population, right? And these are the values that we got. And we can also fix the population variance value at different values. If we fix it to zero, it would be the same as saying all galaxy cluster masses come from one single value and you're drawing from that and it's the same as stacking all the galaxy clusters together. And you can see that basically we're halfway in between like um, infinity and um, zero. So this is kind of like stacking that is determined completely by the data alone. You might be thinking that the hyperpriors are really strong, but they really are not. Um, we can calculate this shrinkage um, parameter, which is like the one minus the variance on the posterior divided by the variance on the prior. And um, from this plot, you see uh, the population mean on mass. Um, that's our posterior, that was the prior. So we're not dominated by the prior at all on our, um, from our hyper priors. And the same for the scale. Now, comparing non-hierarchical to hier hierarchical mass measurements, here I'm showing the marginal posteriors on the masses of each of the galaxy clusters. In gray shaded is the posteriors we get when we fit non-hierarchically. And what you see in some of these um, posteriors is that a lot of them are truncated, and that was simply because we were using um, harsh prior boundaries, remember we were using 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 16. So these posteriors are truncated by that prior. And so if you were to take a mass measurement from that, you would be biasing your results. Um, the black lines show the hierarchical approach. And these are all like pulled towards the posterior mean. And so all the posteriors, even though the prior was quite wide, they um, they, they don't have this truncation at all. So you don't get upper limit mass measurements. So that's really nice. Um, but ultimately, even though we can now get quite good mass estimates on galaxy clusters, even with very noisy data, um, ultimately what we want is cosmology. And these masses are going to feed into the cosmology. So why not sample directly from the true halo mass uh, function and not use this Gaussian approximation. So this is where I encountered a problem because the halo mass function is actually really, really nasty. And I've been having problems like coding this up in STAN, mostly because there are a lot of integrals. A lot of them are improper, so the limits are minus infinity to infinity. Um, and they're multidimensional, so it's integral within integral within integral. And um, you might be able to do this with an ODE solver, but it's ODE embedded within ODE within ODE ODE. And this is very unstable and very um, slow to run. So um, one of the ways I managed to get around this, um, some of you pure uh, statisticians in the room might not appreciate this, but 
um, I developed a PDF <laughs> estimator uh, emulator with a mixture density network. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with neural networks, basically you take an input, um, it goes into a, a neuron, basically, um, which uh, multiplies it by some weights, adds some bias, and then you have an activation function to determine whether or not that neuron fires, um, and then it spits out an output. And you compare this to the true value that you expect, and you play around with the weights and biases until you get your truth. And that's basically your neural network trained. In my case, the input for me is the cosmological parameters, the selection function. These go into the neural network. It hits a load of neurons with weights and biases and activations um, that you have to fit for. Um, and then it outputs um, a number of Gaussian mixtures. So the components, they have weights to make sure that everything sums to one. Um, it has a means and uh, variances. And you're going to compare this to the true halo mass function involved with the selection function um, with some sort of loss function until the weights and biases um, turn out good. So step by step of how we develop this is that we sample some cosmological parameters and uh, cluster redshift and selection function parameters. Uh, we generate the simulations of the halo mass function involved with the selection function. This is then input into TensorFlow, uh, which we use to train the weights and biases and spits out some Gaussian, sensible Gaussian mixtures, and then we save those weights to use in STAN, because then it's very simple, because it's just matrix multiplication and, and addition, and that's very easy for STAN to differentiate. So I use 20,000 simulations of five parameters. We focus on omega matter, which is like how much mass there, matter there is in the universe, sigma eight, which is like the size of uh, the initial fluctuations in the universe. Um, you've got parameters for the selection function and the cluster redshift or its distance. We use eight Gaussians in our mixture model, uh, two hidden layers, each with 30 nodes. And you can see on this plot that it works really, really well. So uh, the dotted red lines are the fit, and the blue is the true. Um, so the fit is uh, the, the sum of the Gaussian mixtures, and the, fit, the true is your true halo mass function with the selection function. And so to estimate the probability of a given mass, then it's just the sum over the weights times the Gauss Gaussian components. So it's very simple. Um, in STAN, it looks like this. We still got the shear profiles of all the galaxy clusters, etc. cetera. Um, but now we have data, which are the neural network weights that we trained with TensorFlow. And these are just like matrices and vectors, etc. cetera. Um, for the parameters, I also add a concentration and mass relation um, that I fit for, um, as well as the cosmology, the selection function parameters, et cetera. And this is pretty similar to um, the other hierarchical model. The new part then is in the model itself. Um, so we have priors on the cosmology and the concentration mass relation. And now, instead of drawing um, the parameters of the Gaussian that we were doing, we have um, to draw from this new function, um, this Gaussian mixture function, we just do target plus and the log sum of the components of the, um, of the Gaussian mixture. Um, yeah, so it's as simple as that. Um, it works very, very well. Um, so we tested this on some toy simulations, uh, 557 galaxy clusters. Um, these were the input 
cosmology and selection, and these were the outputs. So this is still quite preliminary work. I just finished this up like a week or two ago, so um, yeah, it works quite well. Um, these were the fitted values from Stan. Um, the posteriors look very, very nice. And then I checked with the shrinkage as well to check that I'm not dominated by the priors. Um, so we've got what, sigma 8, omega matter, and the selection parameters. And in general, it looks good for now. So I'm pretty excited about this. Um, yeah. So the next steps of this, of course, is to expand to more cosmological parameters. So there's, there's about 10 cosmological parameters in total. Usually people play around with like four or five, but um, yeah, I, I'm excited to extend this further. Um, also, this uses quite um, small uncertainties on the shear profiles that I generated in the toy model. Um, so I want to test what are the limitations based on the uncertainties on the shears, um, and how many galaxy clusters we need to constrain the cosmological parameters this way. But this isn't a worry for me, because in the future, what we've got coming up is a lot of weak lensing data. So these are all like the observations, future ongoing and completed of weak lensing surveys um, as a function of area and kind of depth, right? And the ones I'm most excited about are hypersupreme CAM. You've got deep, ultra deep, and wide fields. LSST in the U US and Euclid, which is a space-based telescope, which is going to remove all those atmospheric blurs and, and other things. So we're going to get really accurate weak lensing measurements to come. We're going to get a lot of data. Euclid is going to measure 2 times 10 to the 5 galaxy clusters. So that's going to be more than enough to constrain our cosmology, I think. Yeah, so um, to wrap that up, um, cosmology with galaxy clusters tends to be quite difficult because the data is so, so noisy. Um, but we can use hierarchical inference to correctly propagate the errors through, um, to get better constraints um, by using lots and lots of data to constrain the noisy data, and to consistently determine how much that we stack, which is much better than what people in my field have been doing so far. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maggie, for a very interesting talk. Uh, questions? So I'd like to know, oh, 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 over there. So please draw it further. Does this work? OK. It so um, I'm not sure if I was able to follow everything, but um, if I understood correctly, the, um, the radial mass profile for the galaxies, that was about the galaxies that were in the background, right? Yeah. So, so those, those would no, be of very no, no, no. different vintage. Sorry? So those, those can be at very different distances, so yeah. they would be of very different vintage. At some point in the early universe, there were no galaxies. So how can you be sure that galaxies of very different vintage would follow the same radial mass profile function? Uh, sorry, I answered the first part wrong. So, so the radial mass profile is of the foreground galaxy cluster, oh, okay. right? And um, we're just using the background galaxies, their shapes, to infer how much mass is in this galaxy cluster. So the, the radial distribution of mass is not important for, a, for the background ones? Um, well, we use the shapes of the background galaxies to infer okay. the radial profile of the mass. And the more galaxies that we get, the better constraints that we can get on this radial profile, because um, 
Like I said, the shapes of the galaxies change of order 1%. They're already intrinsically elliptical, and this change in shear is of 1%. So if we have many, many, many galaxies, then we can get a better signal. Um, so, yeah. All right, thank you. Well, <laughs> um, so when you fit the hierarchical model uh, to the simulated data uh -huh. and you showed that sort of fit line of the sort of the clustered versus the hierarchical model, the, the smaller galaxies were consistently overestimated. Yeah. And you could sort of also see that in your shrinkage plot yeah. where the top ones were being pulled down much less than the bottom ones were. Yeah. Are you worried, so two, two questions, are you worried about that and have you considered using some sort of asymmetric random effects distribution to sort of control for, allow for different amounts of shrinkage on each side? Uh, I haven't for the latter. Um, I'm not too worried about that because this is pretty much much better than what other people have been doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's something that we know about. We tend to have bias estimates on the low mass end because their signal to noise is so low and so it's more difficult to constrain their masses well. Yeah. Oh, this is wonderful. Um, the, uh, could you go back to the, uh, the neural network thing real quick? I wanted the, the little surrogate model thing. Um, curious about this. I know other people probably are as well. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Ford, Ford. This guy. Okay. Um, so what's happening here is you've got this complicated function. Um, you've got a, a, it's a, it's a PDF on this normalized mass thing and like, um, it's a function of these four parameters up here. Yeah. Um, so what's happening, just to clarify here, is you've got these four parameters that you're going to try to estimate in your model. You're going to use this sort of surrogate density thing um, to go about doing that. Is that is that what's happening? Yeah. So um, these five parameters, yeah. you can you can um, oh, use five. theory yeah. um, to give this blue function. Okay. The, the truth, mm -hmm. that's what it looks like. Um, and it's just like integrals over redshifts and masses and all sorts of things. Um, and it's about like 20 pages of theory. So it, cool. it's really annoying. Um, and um, so we can do this quite easy with numerical mm -hmm. integration and it's quite mm -hmm. quick. I, I'm not sure how accurate it is, but it works. Um, and Stan has troubles with that because yeah, right. it's a lot of integrals embedded within each other. That's so instead, if you use a mixture of Gaussians, so like, I don't know where the Gaussians yeah. live, but you can imagine eight Gaussians together form the red dotted line mm -hmm. when summed together. That's cool. And um, did, you, did you have any problems um, with, were you just a, like, did you have any problems with doing like the surrogate modeling stuff with like, and it, you, you, you want to build the surrogate model so you're always like interpolating, right? Yeah. Um, like did you have any problems with like where like the sampler was trying to go outside or did you just, like how did you handle that situation? You just ex extend, run more simulations on your surrogate model? like. Um, so I've got quite tight priors on the cosmology. Yeah. And that quite helped I think. Um, cool. But they, Okay, very cool. Like, I, I, it's, it's neat to see stuff like that work. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Anybody else? I want to throw this. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. You had the picture with the bins, and you said that <coughs> they're overemphasized in the center, and then 
Uh, you have to smooth them on the sideways. There is multiple ways of doing that. So <coughs> what kind of methods you did to get the, the end result? The what, sorry? You had the picture where you had the pinning picture, where you formed the beans. The pinning picture? Yeah. Like uh, it, for the shrinkage or? No, it was very early. Early? Yeah, earlier. This one. This one? Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> when you formed the beans and you said that it's overemphasized in the middle. Yeah. And uh, underemphasized uh, on the sideways. Yeah. What kind of methods you try to get the end result and what impact it had? To get the what? Sorry. I'm so <coughs> how did you, what kind of methods you used? This is just a histogram of the individual mass masses. So if you remember, this is from um, toy simulations. And uh, so we know the input true masses, and uh, we fit them hierarchically. And if you just take the point estimates and his take a histogram of them, um, you get this, which is pretty much what people do to uh, fit the halo mass function for cosmology, is that they just bin point estimates of objects, and they don't take into account the full posterior of the mass estimates. Uh, uh -huh. Did you try uh, to fix the, well, it looks here very smooth, but if you get this kind of result where you have like bins, uh, you may have like they are not connected in yeah. one bin. So how did you make sure that they are like look realistic? Um, I don't know. Okay, we <laughs> need to go for a coffee break so you can yeah. continue there. Uh, so thank you. Thank Again, you. Maggie. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, just in case if you have noticed, there's uh, the electricity available around the room, the black uh, cords and sockets uh, between the benches. So check nearby if you need to charge your laptop. Great. Okay. There's our speaker. All right, welcome back from the coffee break, everybody. Uh, we're gonna have our first uh, set of talks, and our first one is from Arya Porzan, Porzanjani? Porzanjani, sorry, I've been in Germany too long. Uh, anyway, everybody, uh, please give him a round of applause and welcome him to the stage. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm Aria, I'm a fifth year PhD student at uh, UC Santa Barbara, and I'm going to be talking about modeling blood uh, with ODEs and fitting those ODEs when you have not so conventional data. Um, but before I do that, I wanna motivate why we're studying uh, blood. So to do that, I. I'm going to ask a question. How many people here are under the age of 45? Okay, so qu quite a few people, mostly um, almost everyone, it seemed like. So um, <laughs> for people under the age of 45, trauma is the leading cause of mortality. So that's uh, injuries, uh, mostly from car crashes, or getting run over, or shot, uh, something like that. And, and for people over the age of 45, it's actually the third biggest killer after uh, heart disease and cancer. So uh, what, why is this relevant to blood? 
because um, if you talk to trauma doctors, a lot of them say that um, a lot of these patients are dying because they can't stop bleeding and they lose too much blood. So uh, what we study is why they can't stop bleeding. So this talk is in two parts. Uh, first, it's the modeling part, where I'm going to talk about the system we're using and how we actually get the data and measure this system. And then that's going to lead into uh, fitting the system in Stan and kind of more of the mathy part. All right. So human blood uh, consists of, well, amongst other things, uh, several proteins that are interacting over time to form clots. So one protein activates another, which activates another, which eventually down the line uh, turns one other protein into something that can hold a clot. And then you have other proteins that interact to uh, break down the clot and all these proteins are blocked by other proteins. So it's this big complicated system that I've um, sort of whittled down into uh, seven key players here. And uh, all of this can be modeled using a system of ODEs. Um, so something like that, which is what I've been using. And from that, you can uh, simulate these states. And what you get is a profile of all of these proteins over time. So that third one from the bottom that kind of starts at zero and slopes up, that's uh, one of the key proteins that holds together clots. So that's kind of uh, useful to know. And so there's two ways uh, doctors can actually measure the states of this coagulation system. Uh, the first is they can take blood samples and get and uh, directly measure the concentrations of uh, each protein. So that's nice and informative and direct. Uh, the problem is, is that those assays are generally expensive and they take a while to run and they're usually only available at um, like research hospitals. And the slow part is pretty important because in, um, in trauma, uh, getting the right care quickly is of the essence. So um, the other way to, men to measure this system is through a technique called thromboelastography, or TEG for short. And uh, what this is, is it measures the blood viscosity rather than proteins directly by uh, moving a small probe through a sample of blood as it's clotting. So if you imagine uh, moving your finger through a bowl of honey, it's uh, harder than moving your finger through water. And so um, same concept here, we can move a probe through blood as it's clotting to measure its, um, how, how big or clotted it is over time. And so what you get is a time profile kind of like that, uh, where on the x-axis you have time and um, kind of on the y-axis you have, well, it's kind of mirrored here so that it kind of resembles an actual clot, but that's basically uh, viscosity over time of the clotting process. So this assay is ubiquitous. I think it's available in most hospitals in the US and uh, Europe. There's something equivalent nowadays. It's fast and cheap, um, but it's clearly um, a level of abstraction away from the underlying system of proteins. Um, and the other issue is that the way this data is communicated 
and stored is not by looking at one of these graphs, it's actually by looking at uh, some of these summary parameters. So for example, MA, the maximum amplitude, is the uh, value of the, well, the biggest the clot ever gets in millimeters. And R there is the time, uh, the first time that the clot gets to, gets bigger than a certain value. So you could think of that as uh, how long it takes for the body to start forming a clot. And there's others I'll talk more about in a bit. So uh, what a data set might look like is uh, here's a uh, male patient, age 22, who had a stab wound, and uh, we might have some protein measurements, and then we'll have some TEG measurements, in this case, uh, the R, the K, the MA, and the LI30, which I'll explain more about in a bit. Okay, so the name of the game here is going to be uh, translating the TEG parameters, which are easy and cheap uh, to get, into this uh, into actual protein values, which are more informative of kind of what's going on under the hood, so to speak. And so why would this be useful? Um, because it would help in diagnosis and, and better understanding clotting. For example, if a patient uh, isn't clotting because they're low on a certain protein, then uh, we can replace that protein uh, for them. Or uh, we can take tag data that's already be, been recorded and use that to better understand what happens to the clotting system during trauma. Okay, but the question is how? Uh, how do you take the weird maximum amplitude and first hitting time uh, data and convert that into proteins? And the answer is by modeling the generative process and fitting it in Stan, just like any other problem. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so let me talk about our, the generative process now. Um, basically, we start with our protein ODE system, uh, Y prime equals F of Y, and we solve that and we get those solution curves. So those are representing the proteins over time. And we can call that y of t. It's just a function of time. And then from that, uh, we have to translate the protein into uh, clot thickness. And so um, this is uh, one functional way to kind of do that. And so that's a um, clot thickness um, curve over time. And so that's typically what um, you'd get from running a uh, running tag, except uh, in the data, you'd actually get the summary parameters. So there's one more step. And um, the way those work is, for example, the R, is the first time that the um, clot viscosity is above 0 0.02. The K is the first time uh, the clot viscosity is above 20 uh, millimeters. The MA is the maximum amplitude. And the Li30 is um, the, the amplitude of the clot after 30 minutes uh, divided by its max amplitude. Uh, so that's the data we actually have. Uh, not an actual measurement of a curve, which is more typical when you're fitting ODEs. Um, you have these hitting times instead. Um, so there's one problem with this that you'll notice is that to get these uh, hitting times and the max, you actually need a continuous function, uh, but that's not what we get when we solve an ODE numerically. 
we actually get um, the solution at a discrete number of points. Uh, so that means we're going to get the clot thickness at a discrete number of points. And so we can't get continuous hitting times and continuous uh, max amplitude from that. So to make a long story short, we're going to have to use some interpolation technique. Um, so I'll go over this part quick since I'm running out of time. But um, basically, the way we ended up doing it here is by taking those points and uh, using cubic splines to interpolate uh, the solution points. Um, and the reason we did that was because we wanted a smooth um, differentiable function so that we can call things like um, a Newton solver on it to solve for the roots of the equation of the derivative so we could get the hitting times and the maximum and so forth. Uh, so we went with cubic splines which, uh, as a lot of you may know, is uh, just piecewise defined um, cubic functions. And the way uh, you fit them, um, you end up having to solve a tridiagonal matrix. Um, so you have to use a special solver for tridiagonal matrices. Um, called the Thomas solver, which scales in linear time with the size of the matrix, which is pretty easy to code up in Stan. Um, so once we get that continuous form, um, then we can start running our root finding algorithms, uh, such as Stan's built-in Newton method. Uh, or in our case, we coded up a custom uh, bisection method for finding the roots in C++. I think at the time we were doing this, uh, we couldn't specify initial guesses for the Newton iterations, so that's why we went with that choice. Um, ah, so once we have all of that, then uh, the uncertainty from our data sort of propagates up our uh, generative process, and then we have different possibilities of the clot thickness curve and different um, possible realizations of the actual protein curves over time, uh, as you'll see there, and eventually um, a distribution on the possible initial conditions of proteins. And so from that original data, uh, you can see that patient was missing their TPA uh, protein measurement. So uh, that's, I took draws from their prior there up top, which comes from the uh, population distribution. And then at the bottom is their posterior, which then incorporates those four pieces of tag data. So um, you can see we're actually getting uh, information from that, which is useful that we didn't have before. So mission accomplished. Um, Okay, I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Ben and Ty and the rest of the Petzold Lab at UCSB, and Eric and Daniel Lee of the Generable Crew in New York. Thank you. Uh, great presentation, thank you very much. Um, so, some of the sundial solver, which is the solver that's used in Stan, that's right. does actually have a root, capab root finding capability, so you don't have to do all that. Yeah, stuff. I, so mean, I, I, I think Stan doesn't expose it, is perhaps the problem. Uh, Stan does have a root finding solver um, that uses the uh, Newton's method. Um, and Newton's method, as you may know, is sensitive to the initial guess. So um, the initial guess of the root you use. And at the time we were working on this, 
I don't think you could specify that initial guess dynamically in Stan. So we decided to go with our own custom root finding solver that um, was more or less straightforward to write, but I think that might have changed recently. Sorry, another question, which is that that, that data will be very noisy. I mean, I've, I've worked on hemoglobin measurements, and you can send the same sample to aliquots to do different labs, and you'll get a, a different reading for exactly the same sample. So did, how, how did that, how did you, what, did you, can you talk about that a bit, how the, the data was noisy? And um, Yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, modeling question. Uh, and it's hard because uh, for these patients, we didn't have repeat samples of the same measurement. Um, so we're kind of having to estimate the, uh, the variance of the noise distribution uh, over patients rather than within patients, uh, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. All right, uh, so uh, by doing a cubic feeding, basically you introduce some bias uh, for the solution, right? How do you account for that? Uh, right, so the, so the actual solution of the ODE, uh, the true solution probably isn't a cubic spline, you're right. Um, but we figured that it was close enough that um, the numerical error introduced there would uh, be small relative to the errors on the things we wanted to estimate. So, yeah, and, and it seemed to do well in our initial tests. I mean, uh, there you can see an example of it uh, fit to discrete solution points. Hi, nice, uh, nice talk. I have a question. Um, some of the concentration plots, they look like they would be non-decreasing. Non, non so there could be some, is there any way um, monotonicity you could exploit for the splines, like eye splines, for instance? Have you tried that, or did that didn't work for you? Um, so for these, um, so for the clot thickness curves, they're actually uh, not totally monotonic. Mm -hmm. Uh, like this curve, if you look closely, once it hits the peak, it starts to decay a little, and that's representing the clot uh, breaking up. So uh, for here, we just went with uh, regular cubic splines rather than monotonic splines. I see. Oh, cool. Yeah, that, that looks better. Um, uh, first, I'd like to thank Ati Honkela and his colleagues, who's somewhere around, uh, because this work was greatly inspired by his paper, um, which wasn't in Stan, so I moved to Stan and uh, learned a lot along the way. Um, so, the thing we're working with is gene expression, uh, which is the process where you have DNA, uh, and there are some proteins binding to the DNA, and then the genes, some parts of the DNA get, get copied and they are expressed and they influence the behavior of the cell. Uh, and uh, we are particularly interested in, uh, in other molecules, proteins that influence whether 
a gene is expressed or not, which in the end is the way the DNA program is executed, or to some extent. This is a great simplification. Uh, and uh, you can measure gene expression, and uh, for example, one of the data sets we work with look like this. So uh, this is from bacteria. Uh, you have measurements of gene expression over time. Uh, the units here are, are quite arbitrary. Uh, this is microarray data, so the units are not really meaningful. Uh, and we see that some of the genes are not expressed almost at all over time. Uh, some, some race and expression, there's lots of dynamics going on. Uh, this is actually quite a big data set for, for this kind of problem uh, because usually uh, you have very few measurements. This one has 14, which is a lot. Uh, sometimes you get four, sometimes you get 20, but this is relatively big. Uh, so that's why Bayesian approach is, um, uh, is appealing because we don't have a lot of measurements. Uh, and uh, we, on the other hand, we have a lot of genes. So even like simple bacteria have several thousand genes. So like the data are big in this dimension, but uh, we don't have a lot of measurements for, for the same gene. And our task here uh, is uh, to try to figure out, looking at these time series of expression, uh, try to figure out which uh, interactions between the genes are plausible. So which genes might have influenced the expression of other genes. So that's the, that's the question we are, we are trying to answer. Um, so we have some idea of how the influence of the regulator on the target gene might, lo might look like. And this, we use this differential equation to describe this. So uh, where XY is one of the possible target genes, so the change of its expression or its mRNA level, so this is just the synonym for expression, over time uh, is dependent on, uh, on certain set of regulators, of expression of certain regulators, uh, which are weighted. So we have some regulatory weights, some are more important, some are positive, some are negative. Uh, there is just to threshold to have nice linear, uh, linear combination. Uh, this is fed through uh, a nonlinear function. Uh, and uh, multiplied by some like maximum synthesis of the, of the mRNA. So this is the synthesis term. So we know that the regulators influence how much of new mRNA is synthesized, how the expression rises. Uh, at the same time, there is degradation, which we assume happens at constant velocity, which is a great simplification, but everything in biology is a simplification if you want to model it. So we just hope this works. Uh, yeah. And uh, so this is our relationship between, uh, between if we know the regulator, how we expect the target to, to behave. Uh, also, I'm going to use, from time to time, I'm going to use rho uh, to, uh, to signify uh, just the linear combination that's fed to the, uh, to the, uh, to the function. And uh, here, the function, we use a sigmoid function, because at low concentrations, we expect no expression to occur. And at high cons at, uh, when the regulatory input is very high, we expect that uh, the cell can, can produce the product only at a certain rate, so there's a maximum rate to be reached. And after that, any increase in regulators will have no effect. And we use the standard, uh, standard uh, logistic sigmoid uh, to model, model this fact. Uh, uh, one more thing, because we cannot observe uh, directly the expression, the expression ex is observed noisily, uh, we have to model uh, the unobserved state of the regulators. Uh, and I've tried two ways to do this. I've worked with Gaussian processes, and they were a pegin. And um, for, I'm not really sure I totally understand it, but I couldn't get them to work, although they are very appealing theoretically. Uh, and also they are kind of computationally uh, expensive, so you need to decompose, decompose the, the, the metrics to, to draw from the normal distributions. Uh, and they were problematic uh, also computationally. Uh, so I switched to splines, which were way faster because you just multiply a matrix. Uh, on the other hand, they are, they are slightly less intuitive in setting priors for, uh, and you have some tunic parameters like the number of nodes uh, that are not very straightforward to set, so that's a huge disadvantage, uh, but it makes the model work a bit better in my examples, so. Well, that's it. Uh, and in a perfect world, 
uh, you would work with what something I would call the big model. So you would take all the regulators you expect there to be, because there are some ways biologists know which genes are possible regulators. Uh, and you would take all the possible targets, for example, from different experiments, you can check like where, uh, which, which genes might be influenced in some way. And you would fit one big model where you would consider all the interactions. And this has several issues. Uh, one of them is that this model is big and uh, has a lot of parameters, so it's slow. And uh, the bigger problem is that we are not sure which interactions take place. But if we build the big model, it implicitly assumes that, you know, that there is a relationship because we are the, we are the model equation. So if the, lots of the genes we consider possible targets are actually not influenced by the regulator, the, when fitting the big model, then the downstream genes will influence uh, the latent state of the regulator. And they may actually shift like the regulator way away from what was measured just because we've included genes that are actually not regulated. Uh, and the only thing I know how to solve, how to resolve that would be to add a discrete latent variable, like is the regulation taking place or not, then you would have to marginalize over all the possible uh, two to the n states, which blows up very quickly. Um, so um, that's one of the things I'm super happy, if you have some ideas how to solve that, so just please get in touch, I'll be super happy to hear some ideas. Uh, but instead, what I do is look at one target at a time, uh, which uh, makes this problem go away, uh, and you know, if, if the model doesn't fit, I, I believe that the regulation is not really taking place. And sometimes, because we don't have a lot of data, we usually actually only have one regulator and one target, or up to two regulators, because when you have two or three regulators, you're already, uh, you can already fit, fit almost all the data I have with any combination whatsoever, because it's just so little data. So that's the small model, and I'm gonna work primarily with the small model. Uh, and one more thing we need to do is we need to solve the differential equation. Uh, this is a reformulation of the equation. Uh, does that? Okay. Uh, this is the reformulation of the equation. And you'll notice that it's linear in X. So in the concentration of the target gene, it's linear. So we don't really have to use some ODE solver and we can, par we can uh, transform that uh, into uh, into two parts. The, here uh, we have the initial concentration and exponential decay, uh, which is one parameter, and uh, then we have a definite integral that integrates over all the synthesis times the exponential decay. Yeah? So that's the nice part of having constant decay. We, we, can, we, can, solve, we, can, we can solve the equation and move to a definite integral. And, and this integral is easy to solve with trapezoid rule, um, and it's quite easy to implement in Stan in linear time, uh, works wonders. Um, there are some huge issues with the way the model is used by default, uh, because this, this differential equation is used across a lot of publications already, and one of the problems is that you in, for some data, you cannot really distinguish the sign of the regulation, the sign of the weight, whether the gene activates the target or represses. And uh, here's a simple example. So the red line here is the regulator. Uh, the red dots are the measured target concentration with some noise. And you'll notice that we cannot really say whether a green curve or the blue curve is more plausible. But if you look at the parameters right there, we see that green curve has W of 5, while blue curve has W of minus 5, and they differ in, in lots of other parameters. So, uh, so this is like a huge issue, huge, huge problem, and the only uh, way uh, I, I was able to overcome this non-identifiability uh, is uh, to just fix the sign of W. Uh, so I put this as data, just assuming that we want to check positive and negative regulation separately. And this is not a big deal because we're working with one target at a time, so if, you, if you're interested in both variants, you can easily, uh, you can easily uh, check both of them. But if we work with the big model, that would be another, uh, another complication. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll probably, I hope I have enough time for this. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, there are other non-identifiabilities. For example, if we do a linear transform of W and B in certain situations, when the input is at detail of the sigmoid, uh, you'll notice that although we are changing W and B substantially, the resulting curves are almost identical. These are three curves. If you, if you, if you don't see just three curves, they're almost identical. And this is because at the tail of the sigmoid, the sigmoid is approximately linear at, certain, at, at the scales we're working at, we're working at. And so linear transformation of the parameters doesn't really, doesn't really, do, uh, doesn't really have a huge effect. Uh, or when we work with the synthesis and degradation parameters, uh, once again, we can change them substantially. Here you see we, we, we move from S10 to S180. And if, if we also increase D, we get very similar curves. And once again, if you assume that the red dots are what was measured, there's not really, we cannot really say like which of these curves is, is more plausible. But they differ substantially in the parameter values. So which uh, poses all sorts of problems for Stan. Uh, but luckily, this is solvable by a reparameterization. Uh, hey, hey, yeah. Uh, where reminding the model equation and that we use rho i to determine the linear combination, uh, we can, instead of working directly with the parameters, we introduce new parameter to represent the, exp the, the mean value of the regulatory input and another to represent the standard deviation of the regulatory input. And now we've collapsed all the, lots of those W and B combinations together uh, so, uh, so that uh, if, like, uh, if, so if, if we're in the tail of the sigmoid, we still, we still uh, have like, uh, sorry, I got a bit tangled. Uh, it's easy to put priors on those, so we can say things like we assume the input to be around zero, around the center of the sigmoid, and uh, we assume that we don't really reach at the very tails of the sigmoid because nothing interesting happens there, uh, and it resolves a lot of things. But we need to know the sign of the regulation. And we also have another parameter, which is derived from S over D, normalized over the, some of the expression values we observe, which is nice because this is uh, not related to the data. This is not under units of data. This is dimensionless quantity. Uh, I skipped a lot of things. So the model has multiple uses, uh, which you can uh, check out uh, in, the, uh, in the use case online. Uh, then I use comparison about sev across against several baseline models to determine if the regulation actually takes place. So if the if the model uh, with the regulation fits the data better than model where no regulation is assumed, uh, using Clue or Wyke, uh, which you, you can find in the case study, uh, it does work okay-ish. For some reasons, it's not that better uh, than using maximum likelihood over the same model with Stan, and I'm still looking into why this is the case, because it should, I mean, Stan is great, it should work better than maximum likelihood, um, <laughs> but it doesn't. And I'll be super happy to hear your ideas uh, to prove me wrong and show me that it's possible to fit the big model, or that there's a better way to work with the ODE, or that I should not provide the regulation sign as data and, you know, have some other approach to this problem. Uh, so you can check out the source code and everything else online. And uh, I'm uh, wondering what are your questions? Hi. Uh, for the trapezoid rule, uh, how do you, uh, do you use an adaptive step size or width of the trapezoids or? Yeah, not really. This is just, this is set as data. So you assume, because you know like the data are measured like every 30 minutes or something. No, this is like 15 minutes, every 15 minutes. So you assume that like every, every minute, one, one minute time step is okay and you, you run with that. Okay, uh, I think the 1D integrator in Stan is coming out soon, which probably you could get a good speed up from because it's able to probably adapt the step size. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the 1D integrator, but I'm not sure it's going to help because 
there's a, there's a stupid dependency between time and the latent regulator profiles. And so as far as I understand, the regulator will require me to be able to evaluate the derivative at arbitrary time points, which I probably won't be able to do because I, uh, I, have, uh, I have this plan basis for on only for certain points. So it w either would be inconvenient with the, uh, to like uh, recompute spline basis for every evaluation needed in the integrator, or, or if I would use Gaussian processes, I would probably be completely uh, completely in trouble because I would need to like, I, I have like an array of parameters and I need to interpolate between them to get the regulator value at arbitrary time point. So I think that's gonna be difficult. Um, I'm, once again, I'll be happy to be proven wrong, but uh, I, I think that the, uh, uh, the integrator might not help. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. About the big model, all I was thinking about is that you have this, uh, if you have a time series and you want to uh, then there in stand, for instance, in the profit library, if you want to model change points, then you simply use a very sparse prior on each of the individual change point. Like, did something change here, yes or no? Yeah. And then I thought maybe you might use, be able to use such a thing rather than zero or one that you said, but just you put a very sparse prior on it. And everything, but I'm far from an expert, and I'm guessing there is an expert in the room. So, uh. yeah, okay. Oh, thank you. I, I'm going to have a look in yeah. into that. Thank you. Cool. Call to be afterwards. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I was wondering, since you have all those kinds of non-identifiability issues, is this? sort of an appropriate model at all. So do we get something out of, sort of in terms of understanding of what happens, um, even if we sort of get a, some result of the ODE, given some constraints? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Um, so uh, there are two reasons I use this model. One, because my boss told me to. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and two, there are some theoretical reasons uh, that you can derive this as a special case of, of when you model like actual like binding events uh, on the DNA, then this can be derived as a special case with certain simplifications. Uh, so in that, it's appealing also in, from theoretical perspective, this, uh, this model. Yeah. So I, if that's an answer. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so um, I didn't really follow, I mean, where do you get these regulator profiles? Is it just a completely latent variable? Because, I mean, these regulators are proteins that have genes, come, are being translated from genes that you, you typically would measure. So are you taking this information into account? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, sorry if that was not clear. So. I generally assume that I have measurements of, of the regulator. Uh, so for the bacterial case, we can actually assume that mostly there are some, some caveats that you can actually get away with assuming that the protein concentration is proportional to the mRNA concentration, which is not that okay assumption in eukaryotes as far as I know. Uh, but, we have, but we treat those as measured with some error uh, and yeah, so you 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 either can you either can uh, assume that the uh, gene expression is related to the re reg regulatory protein level, or you can introduce uh, one more layer of differential equations where you assume that there is w some process that translates from mRNA to the protein that actually regulates uh, regulates the target. We have one more speaker. Can we get the cube too? Uh oh. Wow. <laughs> no harm done. All right. I'm sorry. Where's our. Uh, oh, that's you. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Come on up. You got your slide down. Yes. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, 
Uh, this talk was originally uh, supposed to be given by Sebastian Weber, uh, who's working in statistical methodology group uh, at Novartis. And he's also one of the uh, developers of STAN. But unfortunately, uh, with quite short notice, I had to uh, step in here, so uh, bear with me. So I'm going to talk about uh, solving original differential equations uh, in the wild and uh, how to do scalable uh, pharmacometrics with STAN. So the outline of the talk is first I'm going to mot motivate uh, you like what is pharmaco pharmacometric modeling and then with one case study uh, for this drug called warfarin uh, I'm going to show you how we can actually do it and finally uh, conclude. So first, first about uh, pharmacometric modeling. So uh, whenever we are doing a drug therapy, uh, we aim to treat some disease. Uh, and when we take some drug, it's administrated somehow into our body. And we do this for the drug or the active compound of the drug to reach some of some part of the of our body uh, where where it does its trick, and uh, often we take the blood concentration in the body uh, as a surrogate uh, for the uh, like how well the drug works, and usually uh, drug research data. Uh, it contains uh, lots of individual patients uh, for which we have measured uh, how much drug we give uh, at given times and uh, what is the drug concentration on the blood uh, at given times for some period of time for which the uh, drug study uh, lasts. And uh, in pharmacometrics, uh, we aim to model this process. And it's uh, one way to think of it is to divide it to two parts. So first, uh, pharmacometrics, uh, shortened as PEG, uh, and it is the relation of drug administration to the uh, concentration of the drug in the blood. And then the second part is pharmacodynamics, uh, which is the relation of the drug concentration uh, to the wanted effect. And uh, to make this easier to think or in your minds, uh, so pharmacokinetics is uh, what the body uh, does to the drug, and pharmacodynamics is what drug does to the body. And these processes uh, are stated as ordinal differential equations, uh, which we have already talked quite a lot today. And uh, because we have two different ordinal differential equations, we need some link process for them. And uh, here is a figure for you to uh, get it again. So we take a drug, then we have the pharmacokinetic model, uh, which outputs a concentration, and then we use that concentration uh, to get a response. Cool. So how we learn pharmaco, uh, pharmacometric models? Uh, it would be good if we would uh, be able to or if we learned both ODEs at once. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this is quite time-taking. So what we do uh, instead, usually, we solve the first ODE first, then we fix the parameters and use that as a forcing function uh, for the second model. And this is uh, not the ideal solution, but uh, this is faster for the modeler, and actually also the model is faster. And in this work, we concentrate on speeding up the pharmacodynamic models uh, as they give a great example of these uh, forcing functions, and, uh, in, and more often they cannot be solved analytically. And then to get to the case study. 
Uh, and first I'm going to show you the pharmacometric model of uh, this drug warfarin. So, as you remember, uh, the model consists of two parts and uh, we can solve uh, the pharmacokinetic model of warfarin analytically. And uh, tada, here is the solution. Uh, you don't need to know the details, uh, but we can input the uh, patient details and we can output the concentration. And uh, this, what you see here, uh, this is the probabilistic output, but uh, we use this as a forcing function and it is often done and we fix, fix it to the uh, means. And then to the pharmacodynamic model of warfarin, uh, which is our... Uh, our main concentration, which we concentrate on here. So, warfarin is a blood thinner, and quantitative measure of it is a change of protothrombin levels in blood. And uh, this is uh, related to the blood thickness in the, uh, or blood thickness, a measure of blood thickness. And as I said, uh, concentration over time. Uh, we have solved the ODE and fix, we fix the parameters to mean and uh, use this as a forcing function for the pharmacodynamic uh, model. And the pharmacodynamics uh, is described by uh, this semi-mechanistic process uh, you can see here. And R is the response, uh, K, Ks are influx and outflux constants, and uh, EC50 is a concentration when we have a 50% uh, response uh, of the maximum. And unfortunately, this turnover model cannot be solved analytically. And now I'm going to tell you how we can speed the stand, stand model, because it's uh, quite slow if we don't think it well in advance. So, if we would model uh, the pharmacodynamic or the turnover function uh, with stand, the function could look something like this. So we take the uh, input of the, uh, as, or, or we take the data as input. Uh, then, for convenience, conveniency, we rename or make the code more readable. Then we pass them to the uh, function solving the ODE, and then we do the math for the semi-mechanistic model and uh, return the solution. But for this uh, stand run for 32 patients uh, with 250 warm-up and uh, sampling, uh, we, it takes about uh, 15 minutes. And this is bad. Uh, and why this is bad is because uh, currently in STAN, uh, when we use variable definitions in functions, uh, they are considered as parameters. And uh, when we have more parameters, the auto diff tree uh, grows a lot. And we want to avoid this because in this case, they, they are actually not parameters. They are fully dependent on the data. So, uh, by thinking wisely, uh, we can define this function in a way where we don't uh, like use the variables. We just pass the data uh, straight to the function. And again, uh, stand run uh, 250 iterations, uh, or, or warm up and sampling, and for 32 patients, uh, we now use like seven minutes. And this is purely because uh, the auto diff uh, three isn't that uh, that high. And uh, as we have spoken yesterday, for those who were participating in the workshops uh, in the ODE workshop, uh, usually the problem definition for uh, pharmacometric models. Uh, they are hierarchical and uh, they are embarrassingly parallel. This means that for each patient we can compute the likelihood uh, independent of others 
and uh, and we can speed things up. And the likelihood of a given patient, uh, so as I said, can be uh, computed independence, uh, in independence to all other patients. And now, uh, unlike one year ago, uh, this structure can be taken advantage of uh, in, in STAN uh, with this new MapRect uh, functionality. And this function uh, applies a user-defined function uh, to a set of parameters uh, which have, are of rectangular uh, shape. And these evaluations uh, can be performed on uh, a cluster using the MPI interface or parallelized on one computer. And uh, when we compare the times, so here uh, on the x-axis we have the cores or amount of computers we are parallelizing the function to and then on i-axis we have the computation time. So using threading, uh, we get 4.2 time increase using uh, 16 cores and uh, using the MPI uh, on a cluster, we get 6.6 .6 increase, which is uh, quite impressive and we couldn't do this one year ago. And then finally to conclude, uh, we can go from 15 minutes to 45 seconds uh, using these two tricks. And nowadays, Stan has all required components to do uh, scala scalable pharmacodynamic modeling. And in future, uh, it is in the Stan 3 uh, language, we can also define uh, in functions which parameters are defined straight from data and which, which parameters actually are parameters and because of this we can actually make the code more readable in the future while still uh, having the computational uh, performance. And uh, map rect function which is new in Stan gives huge performance uh, gains for large problems as you could see. Thank you. And uh, as a disclaimer, so uh, I'm not, I didn't do the work uh, and I'm here just to <laughs> present for Sebastian, but luckily we have lots of stand developers, so if you have questions about the details of the map rect or new stand functionalities. Uh, I have lots of sidekicks here. Okay, well, let's see uh, if we need them. Um, so there's the, in one of your uh, earlier, I think slide nine was it? There you, sh you showed the uh, posterior from the PK uh, uh, model. Yes. And I, I shouldn't, shouldn't, these are quite noisy actually. Uh, do you think that it's maybe also using hierarch hierarchical modeling or some sort of smoothing could make these better? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know how to uh, answer that question. But uh, yes, actually it is using hierarchical modeling at the moment. Uh, so I don't know why these are uh, so noisy. Uh, did this is, uh, well, I'm sorry, yeah. I cannot yeah. answer okay. the question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, the, uh, I think when we were in the ODE um, tutorial, there was a, someone said it was, there was a linear speed up with the number of cores, and looking at your chart, it seemed to have a sort of limit about, well, sort of for MPI about six times and for threading about four times. Is that, is that just the, the, the particular problem or, or, or uh, I mean, I'm, I, I certainly was surprised you got linear. Well, there are also different parts in the models yeah. uh, besides the thing that we parallelize. Yeah. So 
because if everything was parallelizable, then we could get like linear. But there are uh, I, parts theory. that uh, we yeah, I've have never to seen that myself. That's all. You yeah. know, I've always had a limit. Sebastian has a lot. Sebastian, the guy whose paper is this, actually built most of this, and there's a lot of evaluation of things on the Stan website. So Sebastian's run with 10 separate machines with eight cores each and gotten like a 60 times speed up on these models. So it's not exactly embarrassingly parallelizable, but when you have a, lo a likelihood function that's doing a lot of separable work, it's pretty close. And that was, that was using like an InfiniBand backplane. It wasn't even on shared memory machines. So. Yeah, so it, it's, this problem is pretty simple because it's, it's, we can ship the data off to the particular cores with this MPI thing. So all we ship back and forth is the parameters and then all the hard ODE solving and thing happens on those cores and it's a very lightweight communication. But it all has to be integrated back into the, to the auto diff tree, which is a little overhead. So it's not perfectly linear, but for a lot of problems, it's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, really to, to add what Sebastian wants to underline currently, uh, the like using one computer, like currently the MPI interface, it's faster when we put it on the cluster when comparing the threading. So that's also one thing to keep in mind, and that's uh, apparently related to how things are implemented in Stan and maybe it's going to be better in the future for threading. Okay, I think we need to move on. Uh, no. That was fantastic. Let's thank all of our students. I really want to keep this thing. Maybe next time. Uh, it's on? Okay, cool. Uh, so next up we have some poster spotlights. Uh, so the idea of this is uh, people presenting posters um, are going to do really short uh, presentations to sort of highlight the coolest things about their poster and then you can go and see it afterwards. They'll be by their poster. And the posters are on the third floor, so one floor up. Um, and I think most of them are up now, but if you haven't put yours up and you have a poster, you can pop up and do it in, in the lunch break. Um, so the people in this session, if you want to come up, uh, I think Alaria is first. All right, so uh, first up is Alaria, and she's uh, talking about estimating flood probability bands using flood event data. Yes, uh, the title in the program is even longer than that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the, this is because I am uh, starting to understand how Bayesian statistics work. So I need your advice on a bunch of things. So we were asked at a study group uh, type of event how uh, the decision makers could use some very sparse data about flood events to reassess flood risk in specific areas. So the data we have look like something like this. So we have incredibly small data. If you get 20 years of records, you're lucky. You might observe, say, four floods in a specific place over 20 years. And um, we would want to use this data to make an assessment of what is the risk of flooding in a place. So you don't have a lot to work with. But there are, uh, so we, we use a conjugate prior. We use the simplest possible model. As it happens, I estimate this model in Excel because uh, that's what users use. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my, the poster and my questions to you are about how can I choose some sensible priors for this problem. We have some information on what is the official estimated risk at a place, but this comes in, in an interval, not as a continuous information. So I need to transfer uh, interval information into a beta distribution for my uh, probability of flooding, and that's not incredibly easy. Experts know something about this stuff, but yeah, I don't know how to uh, do the elicitation, so I'll be very happy to have some pointers about that. And then eventually I also need to provide some useful outcomes, which is not a beta distribution, but something about the actual flood probabilities. And because of regulations, need, these need to be in intervals again. 
so uh, it's not so straightforward. And uh, I also think this is a, a pretty good uh, toy example. And if anybody, I'm pretty sure some of you teaches the introduction to Bayesian statistic. This is a pretty good example, I think, to show how it's important to use informative priors, because the, the standard prior of assuming that no flood and flood is equal across the range is not true, because we normally know that it doesn't flood every year in a place. So this is a pretty good sort of like example for uh, using informative priors. So come and see and talk to me. OK, hi, folks. Uh, so today, I'd, I'd just like to present briefly a little, little bit of my work developing uh, the CTSEM package for R, which is basically a, a front end for Stan to do state-space modeling with the option of turning it into a continuous time state-space model and the option of doing this in a hierarchical formulation. So a, a, gen, a general state-space model is, is characterized by a set of Uh, but by, by, by a set of latent processes, e eta, uh, the, these change according to some deterministic function of, of, the, previous, of, the, of, the, of the previous states, uh, some deterministic function of known inputs, and there's, and there's some uncertainty in our, in our function, uh, which is basically what's distinguishing it from a lot of the, the ODE stuff we've been seeing. Um, because in, in this sense, we're acknowledging that we, we really don't know the, the model particularly well, so we're allowing uncertainty in the, in the state function. Then uh, the states are at, at various points are measured uh, by some deterministic function, and again, plus some uncertainty, but here the uncertainty doesn't feed forward through the system. It's just uncertainty at the measurement level. Uh, we, can, we can see this here. We see basically, uh, we, see, we, see up, we, we see our estimate for the latent states shown by the, the, the thick red line. We see the observations shown by the circles. We see we, we, have this, we have this change from our state here up to here. Then we, then we, we, get, we, we get more knowledge about the system from an observation here, which then updates the state uh, downwards slightly. Uh, and we're basically we're, we're wrapping all this in a hierarchical formulation. We're basically, we have, a, we have a multivariate normal going on here with any, any covariates we want. And we have some transformation function to actually set up the, the, the matrices we need, whether, whether they're variants or all, all, all sorts of structures. So this, this works by basically you, you pass in a set of input matrices uh, containing any, any fixed and free, free values, uh, set, up, set up the priors and individual variation as you like, and then, this, then, then you, you pass this to a fitting function which uh, sets up a stand model which uh, incorporates an integration over, over any possible states uh, at a measurement occasion using either classic or uncentered Kalman filter. Uh, it, it, does, it does an integration between, uh, across states, bet between states at different times using either an analytic solution or numerical integration. And then, and then we, we can either sample or integrate over differences between uh, different subjects. And then, th then there's the option of either, either using the, the wonderful n nuts uh, uh, Hamiltonian sampling, or for cases where we want it to be fast, we can also do an optimization and important sampling loop. This, th this, this sort of thing could be useful for cases like s a single subject time series with like ARIMA or continuous time versions. Panel, panel data or dynamic systems. Could also think about it for cases where Gaussian process regression is, is applicable. And great, I'd love to talk to any of you about it. Cheers. I'm Breck Baldwin. Congratulations, you now have a governing body. I'm going to explain to you briefly what that is. I'm going to have a poster where we can, you can come and talk to me or any governing body member that happens to be there to talk about it. And so basically the idea is, is that we had an election in the um, stand developers only group with 32 people, unanimous vote to install this governing body. Um, 20 people voted, nobody said no, and the memberships are there. I'm the executive director, which means that I'm the runaround guy trying to get things done day to day, but I have no actual authority beyond just running around doing things. Uh, Andrew Gelman's chairman of the board, and here Jonah's on there on the committee, Sean Taltz, who else is on? Uh, Dan Simpson, 
I think that's it, right? Did I miss it? Oh, Daniel Lee. All right, so those are people you can talk to that are on the body now. The important bit is, let's just get to the end. Oh, and also Bob is not a part of the stand governing body by his choice. He's running the technical working group. So that's a different thing that he's running and you can talk to him about that. Um, uh, we are all things stand, but I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, the important thing is we're provisional. So we need a new governing body in a year. If you're interested in being on it, if you're interested in serving on it now, please come talk to me. Um, and what else? Yeah, so basically, come talk to me if you're interested in anything about fundraising, helping us guide Stan in the future. We don't care about seniority, we care about energy and commitment to Stan. Thank you. Oh, that's it? Awesome, so that's it. Uh, but we'll continue to have more poster spotlights throughout the conference. Um, so after uh, you get your lunch, you should go upstairs to level three and uh, check out all the posters. There's some really good ones. And before you all run off, um, uh, if you are doing the contributed talks in the next session, um, can you stay here and just come down to the front so we can make sure everything's working all right? And Aki? So the uh, lunch is outside of the hallway. Let the poster presenters to get lunch first so that they can get to the posters and then you get lunch and then you can uh, take your lunch with you and then go see the posters. And specifically go see now posters by the spotlight presenters. Thank you.